Hello and welcome back to a late night talk with my guest, returning guest. It's Richard Swan, the author of The Justice of Kings and The Tyranny of Faith and the third book forthcoming yes. in Empire Vulcan, yes. February 2024. Yes. The trial of the Empire. Is that right? So close. The Trials of Empire. Oh, come on, man. So close. So close. I thought you were a professional. Nope. Absolutely winging it. <laughs> no, I am totally not. winging it. Here we are, <laughs> winging it on a very early morning. Me for me, late night mm. for you. Yes. It so is. yeah, yeah. Mm. You're in the middle. Well, t- technically, you've written book three, and it's coming out in February. But in terms of the market, th- there's always that thing of once you've written the first book, people are like, "Oh, is the pressure of working on the second book?" Mm. But you didn't have that because you'd already written the second book before the first one Correct. came out. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And I had, I think. I so I definitely the, the second one was done and dusted before the, the first book came out. Is that right? Maybe the third book was done and dusted before. Anyway, whatever it was, it's something like that. Yeah, the drafted. And there was anyway. no pressure. I don't think. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was basically done by the time it, it was all came out. Yeah, yeah. I felt no pressure. And so you didn't have that for the third book either. You didn't have any kind uh, of. Yeah. Oh, should I have? Oh, should I change this? Or should I work on that? I book? think I, I I don't tend to be too fast i'm very i'm very confident in my storytelling ability uh, I, <laughs> as a professional storyteller <laughs> i've come to regard what do uh, the readers know um <laughs> i it's interesting i sometimes i see i don't tend to encroach into sort of fan slash reader spaces particularly so i don't know what people are saying about it generally behind the scenes yeah um if anything um, but w- one thing I do do is I will look at the five star reviews on Goodreads. Just you know, nice little kind of <laughs> just know, the five stars, up. please. Just the only stars. the five stars. Only post five my... star reviews, everyone. Thank you. I <laughs> only if you want me to see it. If you've if you've written anything other than a five star, I, will I shan't not be have reading read it. it. No. Um, it, well, it's it's just to protect my it's just to protect my mental health, um, <laughs> Stephen. Because the five stars is a nice little pick me up. Um, some of them are like like very short, you know, like very pithy. Love this mm. book. Great. Some of them are very long and detailed, and I love reading those. Often people tag me in them as well. So if the people, I assume, are nice. Um, yes. Sometimes they aren't. Like very occasionally, I've had two or three where they have been like five stars. Uh, Hello, Richard. I know you're reading this. Right. I despised your book. Thank you. <laughs> it was it was shit. <laughs> um, yeah, but so I do, and so sometimes I get sometimes I'll read in one of those and it'll say something like, "Oh, I really thought that X was going to happen, but it didn't." Or, "Oh, I really think that." You know, so I'm interested, and I know that there's a kind of a certain expectation. Hmm. Well, someone will say something, and I'll think, "Oh, that's okay. It's interesting. That's been taken in that way. That's not actually quite how I intended it." So, you know, then there's a worry that there'll be like disappointment when that sort of thing doesn't come off. But my thinking with book threes is the most important thing to do is write a. And I think Fonda Lee said this actually as well. I think I heard it from her because I read an article. She's obviously a brilliant writer, and I loved her. I'm still. I'm on the third. I'm reading Jade Legacy right now, oh. um, and uh, but I remember reading an interview, and she said, um, with writing the third book of a trilogy, or you know, the final book of a series, mm. the most important thing to do: don't try and like pull the rug out from the reader. Don't like bend yourself in knots trying to come out with like a big twist ending. Mm. You don't have to do that. Like it doesn't matter if people guess what you're going to write. It's much more important that you just write a good ending, even if it's the predictable one. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of people t- will will contrive to avoid the predictable ending, and in so doing, write a, a worse book. And so I um, was very mindful of that going into book three, and I thought I'm just going to write the natural conclusion as i always envisaged it um knowing that you can't please everybody um but i do think that i think i do think people will will be happy um there does seem to be a sort of a bit of a groundswell of people being like really interested to see how like this empire like totally explodes and collapses and it's completely calamitous and i'm sort of thinking "Mm, okay (laughs) 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 those people might be a bit disappointed um but (laughs) <laughs> but otherwise, you know, I think it's good. I'm, I, I am happy with it. It's the sort of ending I would have liked to, to read. Um, well, well, this is it. It's always a case mm. of uh, you should write the kind of book that you want to read. And Definitely. Sometimes you can't find on the market. That's why you wrote that story in the first place. Exactly. Fantasy lawyers. It's interesting. Uh, <laughs> Justice Kings was originally going to be a very different book. Um, and it was originally going to be uh, um, about like much more courtroom 
you know, focused right. battle, as in like battle of words. Um, mm. And the words themselves would have like a kind of magical quality to them. So I had this idea of like legomancy, which is kind of like the <laughs> <laughs> like magical words kind of yeah. with arguments. The original ending of Justice of Kings was much more kind of um, much more kind of cross examination focused. It was much right. more kind of dramatic in that respect. Um, and I was just thinking like, it just doesn't work in terms of like the world build. Like, and I was having to kind of there were so many contrivances to kind of make that happen because I was thinking, well, I've given to Conrad von Vault like basically unlimited authority. Mm -hmm. So why would he do this? Like, why would he? bother to do this kind of particular and so then i was having to kind of be the layer upon layer of contrivance to kind of make it happen and i was like it's just, it's just not working it's just gonna have to be a battle instead <laughs> L law and order fantasy style no yeah. you sir out of order no sir yeah no, sir. i you know what i know but i definitely if i had the time if there was an extra hour in the day i would spend it writing like a sequel to the third book but that had none of the characters in that literally was like law and order so the first half of it would be like the police procedural <laughs> in sober and then the second so, half would so be like the investigating and then yeah, exactly, exactly Conrad literally that. in, in the, exactly in the that. court no i find you guilty yeah. <laughs> oh, <fuck up. laughs> um yeah yeah no literally surrounded like just you know do, just doing sheriff shit i think that'd be great i think people mm. would love that i might actually do that and just self publish him and his it. dog him and the dog heinrich going out heinrich and... that's right oh of course you've read the second book i you, have man. yes yes that'd yeah, be brilliant the two of them going out investigate come on heinrich you and your use your nose track down this yeah villain. exactly villain. that's it yeah you've got it, <laughs> it right itself doesn't it <laughs> like, you know. tv pilot there you go you got first half with sir Radimir, second half yeah with conrad hey. in, the, in the court you know? Well, with the end of the writer's strike, I'm hoping, because we sold the TV, I think I may have told you this last time we spoke, mm -hmm. we sold the TV rights to Justice Kings um, mm -hmm. a very long time ago, and it was all ready to go, and the um, the producer, the American producer said, um, you're all ready to go, but um, we might have to try and get it in before the writer's strike, the pitch, and then they kind of didn't in the end, and so it's been on, kind of on ice and they had the pitch all ready to go and all of the kind of whatever goes into a pitch um and uh so now the strike is over hopefully you know they'll they'll do that i mean i think the, the chances of something happening are basically infinitesimally small well wow. um but you know it's a bit of cash in my pocket yeah you know, this uh, happened with um peter mclean he had his quest the rose throne option mm. And last time I spoke mm. to him, he was like, you know, as much as me, because right after that, there was a strike. And then it all kind yes. of stopped and we were like, ah, and it seems yeah. to have gone dead in the water now, but we don't know. Yeah, that's a shame. So, I don't know what's, I mean, I mean, there's so many of these, <sighs> so many of these series get optioned, don't they? And um, I think the problem with fantasy is they require very big budgets. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and, e and even kind of the lower level, you know, lower well, I mean, yeah, lower low fantastical grid. level, less CGI yes. for yours or Pete's mm. series because it's people in a mm. not a Tudor esque clothing, but more familiar well, style of clothing. Off, yeah, yeah, kind of, you like, know, but but in the very late kind of 15th century. But I think, yeah. um, apparently though, like the period dramas cost an absolute fortune because the costumes, um, are so expensive. Um, so mm. those costume dramas actually cost a phenomenal amount of money. Uh, just to get all of the dresses and the corsets and the, you know... The, well, it's like once the they've commissioned the it and they do the first one, they do a second series because most of it's been paid for in the costumes and all the wardrobe. And yeah, stuff. right. And they're yeah, like, exactly. we may as well yeah, do yeah. a second oh. series because it's half the cost. Yeah. And you're like, all right, then. Do, do, do series <laughs> yeah, two, enough. please. Give me the sweet, sweet residuals. Yeah. <laughs> um. Anyway, anyway, sorry, back to the books. Um, right. <laughs> it would be nice to see some more fantasy that, that was slightly lower Lower than you know, dragons and you know, I, I, rings of power. I know what you and, mean. You know, personally, I think the thing. I think. I think the, if I'm sort of putting on my this is all I'm making this up. I'm putting on my kind of Hollywood, Hollywood executive hat. hat from Hollywood hat, and I'm thinking if I'm like a Hollywood executive, and thinking in the way that they think when they approach, uh, you know, movies and TV and prestige to cut TV, mm. and they're probably thinking like, what is fantasy? it's dragons and it's big castles and it's magic. And so if you're then a fan, if you're like a TV executive and you're presented with a low fantasy setting yeah. where you're like, it's basically like the very early kind of Renaissance, um, but there's a bit of magic. You, you immediately you're thinking, well, that's going to confuse audiences because like, why, like, why, did it, why wouldn't you then just do a period drama? And so I think they probably think the low fantasy is in some ways a harder 
um, marketing box than the high fantasy stuff. Yeah. Um, so I, th- I mean, that is total speculation on my part, but I also think, um, I mean, look at the ones that we've had. Yeah. Game of Thrones, Rings of Power, um, Wheel of Time, Witcher. So like, all, we're looking at the, some of the biggest selling, not just fantasy novels, but novels um, mm. in the world. So, you know, little old me and my little old Justice of Kings with it. You know, it's, it's not well, it, made. It, like, it, it seems it's, almost it's, like... Instead of you know for the the Netflix or the so and so's they take on some of the bigger ones. I mean, it almost means like not one of the streamers to take it on and someone else to take mm. it on a, a different level. And you know, I remember yeah. Peaky Plains was pitched as a bit like Peaky Blinders because that's kind of yes. it's like to a degree. Vibe, and it, yeah, yeah. So pitching yours as fantasy law and order meets the Tudors, mm. some might go, sure, well, oh, all oh. right, you know. Hey, I'd watch it. I <laughs> think, I think, as you know, though, of course, I think. It's deceptive because the the it get, the just the Empire of the Wolf series trilogy gets much more fantastical as it goes on, mm-hmm. um, and in the third one, it's like I mean it's just off the chain. Like you know, half of it takes place in the afterlife, so um, it gets very very quickly. The you know, there's, there's you've got CGI and all sorts going on there, mm. but I mean I saw like I don't know where I was when I saw this, as in on the internet, um, but I saw that there was actually a witch because I I watched the witch. I watched the first two seasons of it. I just never quite got on board with it. Like it just, it was never. It was. Well, I thought there was. It was well acted, and obviously it like, looked quite nice. But yeah, it just, it just never quite seemed to have kind of fit into a coherent narrative very well. Um, and uh, and I was like, it just felt like a bit of a missed opportunity, really, considering the star power they had attached to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I saw like a, an old, like an old, like maybe from the nineties or like early aughts, um, like Polish or or Czech, I think it was maybe Czech, mm. TV series that was based on The Witcher, and it was much closer to the how, I, so it was very kind of just standard medieval basically, like there was very, you know, much fewer kind of fantastical elements there, yeah. and it was genuinely very, very good, Um, and I was thinking like, and, and the scene that I saw, and it was only like five minutes or so, was Geralt basically being set upon by some you know rude nobleman and his kind of champion and there was about 20 or 30 dudes in the shot all with a kind of their armor on it was basically like kind of professional cosplay um but it looked good and they got they, it felt like they got the, the tenor of the the the, the kind of novels just bang on mm. and i was thinking that can't have cost much money to make you know like that really can't have you know a, a random like czechoslovakian um is, is it not czechoslovakia anymore is it Czech, um check yeah. check Czech, Czech, um you know, random check production, like, what are we talking here? Like ten, twenty thousand dollars you know, maybe 30, you know, so you're absolutely right. Like it's, it's, you could do it for much less money than, than they have, but um, you, I guess you're not getting Henry Cavill for that, you know, small fry, are you? No, there's the balance between getting the big star names in to come to TV and pull the audiences versus exactly how far you deviate from the material and then lose your star power as is yeah. the case with the new new series that came out, which I did persist through, much to my regret. But that's, yeah. that's another story, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to like it. I really wanted to like The Witcher, but it just, it was never, it never got to the point where I was really engaged. And I mean, The Rings of Power, I thought was dismal. Oh, it's appalling. Um, I, I, I like, loathed part of it, especially uh, Gladriel. What they did with that character was horrific. Yes. But... I a lot of her power felt very unearned. Although I suppose she's like a three thousand year old elf, um, so maybe not. But I don't. I actually only made it through about an episode and a half, and I think it was just di- the opening dialogue about the stone looking, looking down in the river. I was like, it sounded like to me it was like someone who was like, how kind of like Regency Britain old timey pastiche language can we kind of it's it was like it was the it was someone's idea of how like fusty old british people should speak mm-hmm. it was that sort of dialogue it was it wasn't like good quality dialogue i mean i, I would almost have just preferred modern dialogue like it was just someone trying so hard to kind of capture the essence but they ended up yeah. like coming up this incredibly ham-fisted um you know di- stones look only down whereas i was like what the fuck dude what, what are you talking <laughs> it's the difference <laughs> between about? <laughs> peter jackson working on the material and understanding yeah. the material and someone doing their own and not really yeah, understanding yeah. the essence of it no I mean, exactly that I mean, which yeah. you, you get with any adaptation like if someone had, had adapted your books 
Mm. They, they say, oh, yes, the writers are always involved. I'm like, no, mm. they're not. They want they you over are. there and they'll, mm. they'll put your name as executive producing, sign you a little check. And therefore yeah. you nod and go, yes, I was consulted. Very interesting. Mm. And in fact, they just <laughs> rang you once to tell you they were doing it. What they actually want to do <laughs> is go and do their own thing, which is fine. Definitely. But if they mm. don't understand the core of what you were trying to do in the first place, you end up with that's something it, that's yeah. so diametrically different from the material mm. that mm. it doesn't capture the original fans and therefore it doesn't ignite no. new fans. And it just... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's any been any, like... I mean, I haven't watched Wheel of Time, but it, it looked I very have. poor. I it's, okay. Well, it's okay. It's okay. This, I, this, I just watched... Yeah. I mean, I watched the trailer and I was like, yeah, I, it, everything looks a bit too clean and bright to me. I mean, um, the good thing is it's 14 books and the series is done. The bad thing is it's 14 books. There's mm. no way you could adapt that faithfully for television. You have to cut. A Amazon are not going to do 14 seasons. No one thinks they no. are, is mad. It's yeah, yeah. 10 episodes a season for an hour or eight to 10, I think it is. And mm. they might do six, maybe seven. And that is yeah. it. In 70 hours of TV, you've got, got to do 14 books at 800 pages a pop. Good luck. God. I mean, I've never read the Will of Time, so I don't, you know, I've, I've, I'm have I'm, au fait enough with the kind of people, there's, isn't there like a kind of fairly well-defined like slump where it comes, like maybe book eight or something, because it's not going to lose momentum a bit. I didn't yeah. know, but I, I, I don't read them all. But that, so come back to your books. If someone did mm. want to adapt your books, how involved mm. would you want to be? Would you want to be like, go and do your own thing and I'll smile and say, yes, yes. Or would you actually want to be, <laughs> can I be a voice in the writer's room to be like, I, actually, that's not what I meant when I did that. It, I mean, to be, I mean, of course, I'd love to be involved in it. I don't, um, but also it's at the same time, there's a wonderful kind of, you know, as always with a caveat provided it's done well. And um, there's a wonderful kind of, you, you love seeing other people kind of interpret the material. Um, and I kind of do subscribe to the kind of death of the author um a little bit um and so i wouldn't necessarily if someone said no like it's all in hand don't worry we're going to do it our way i don't think i would be instinctively put out by that um but uh if they said hey would you come would you come would you write some episodes i'd be like of course because that's like a hundred thousand pounds <laughs> so i definitely would do that as well but yeah i don't i don't know i'm trying to think like like think of the expanse I... so when james mm. s.a corey ty frank and, and... Daniel Abraham started, they started as like a voice in the writer room that were just sat in the background. Right. And by the end mm. of like series six, they were actual producers producing the show. They had the name on from the beginning. And I'm like, yes, I'm an executive producer. What did you do? Yeah, and Nothing. I got a fat paycheck for my executive and status. I did a years but they ago. Worked they worked their way of... up. They actually worked their way up from yes. writing an episode, listening, studying production, the whole yeah. thing for six years until they got mm. to the end. We're like, now we'll actually do an episode the whole thing so yeah i mean that's brilliant i i you know i i remember years ago one of the first cases i did as a lawyer one of the first big cases i did was a film it was a film rights you know controversy like a, a guy had kind of basically um folded up a, a film production company and then he'd gone to set up a clone company and kind of basically ciphered off all the contracts so i did become quite au fait with how kind of film financing works and it was amazing how and and that's when I learned that the executive producer is essentially you can do literally nothing. Yes. Um, you know, some people would like to just get executive producer credits on on movies, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. though they didn't do anything. So it can mean it's a, it, it can mean you've done literally nothing at all, or it can mean you've done something. But yes. like more often than not, you're just a kind of fairly passive bystander in the production process, which was very interesting to me. Um, but I'm not hugely au fait with how movies work generally these days um i just saw that uh they write off like that coyote um roadrunner movie that's a tax write-off yes did you read that in the news yeah i saw that mm. yeah same so, with the back girl film they, they shot it and said yeah. we're just not going to release it there. yeah well they just burned the master tapes or something and it's just like great well it's a waste of everyone's time wasn't it <laughs> two years so, of work yeah. but nah yeah not bother yeah. I don't, it seems like a money laundering scheme, to be honest. I don't, I don't know how. I don't know how to get away with it. Let's, let's reel it back into the books. Let's reel it back into the yes. books. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, given I've now read book two, and it's, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. trying to avoid spoilers for those who have not. Yes. It, it's fair to say there is more stuff to do with magic and the afterlife and other levels of 
yes the world the world we were always going to have that from the beginning because at the beginning you've got so conrad in the first book he's got Mm. i don't say minor powers but his powers are Mm. you know the voice and some necromancy to speak to the dead but then it kind of yes tails off and in the second book we come more Mm. familiar with entities and named entities was this always part of the plan from the beginning it it certainly it was and i think um when i with when i'm right and i go my writing process when when I kind of get a book together it usually involves like trawling back through kind of you know lots of notes of like random disparate ideas I've had over the years and years and years and years ago like you know decade plus I had an idea of like what it what what if there was a world but the afterlife was real like a to- mm-hmm. like a totally real place that you, that you went to um and kind of what would that look like and how would that affect society um and I had this idea of for a scene where someone is in the afterlife um, and there's like a battle happening, like a big kind of battle. And so at the same time, like the souls of like the killed soldiers are kind of descending all around them. Mm-hmm. And so I'd had this kind of idea for a, a real tangible afterlife for a long time. But the I think it wasn't until I wrote The Justice of Kings and I kind of wrote the necromancy scene. And I always knew that I wanted the necromancy to have like a very horrifying aspect to it like a very frightening aspect to it um mm. and a very kind of high because it, when you think about like magic magic systems you know because obviously it's a contradiction in terms but when you think about magic and you think um okay well let's say he can extract he can extract a confession from people brilliant or he can um speak to the dead and so you then immediately you're thinking okay so that's a very boring book all of a sudden if it's a murder murder mystery because then you just get all the answers immediately from everybody so then you're kind of th- as a writer you're thinking okay so how do i limit these powers and how do i limit them in like a kind of a, a natural or you know enjoyable to read way and so with the voice i was like well it only really works if you you catch someone kind of off guard a bit or they're a bit of a simpleton or you know they're just not really expecting it but if you are expecting it or you're kind of intelligent or whatever you can kind of learn to resist it a bit mm. um and with the necromancy i was like okay you can speak to the dead but you have to travel literally to the afterlife to do it and whilst you're there you're fair game to like you know the entities the, the demons and the you know the angels and whatever that, that live there and they might want your soul um, and so, you know, it's kind of like, well, it's an extremely potent investigative tool, um, but, oh, you're going to use it very sparingly. The cost, right? <laughs> the cost is too yeah, high. It's very high. Yeah. And so Von Vol essentially has PTSD from using, you know, the, the necromancy power, but it's so useful that like, sometimes you just say, oh, I've just got to bite the bullet and do it. And so I always wanted to do that. And I think, but when I had the, when I was writing Justice of Kings, I had, you know, Agraxes, the tricks that kind of hijack the ritual. Um, and that was kind of an idea that occurred to me quite late. And I was like, that's quite a cool idea. I quite like that, this idea of an entity kind of making mischief. And I wanted to do what I love, what happens in fiction is when like something happens and it's almost like an off, it's almost like an off, you know, almost like an off the, off the, like a, a good example is um, the first reference to the Clone Wars in A New Hope. Why yeah. Obi Wan's like, oh, I knew your father in the Clone Wars, um, and everyone's like, the what? Um, mm-hmm. That sounds cool. And then, but he just never references it again. So- and I, I love those kind of little throwaway references. So I wanted to kind of capture that vibe of one Von Volt saying to Helena, "Oh yeah, that's just a demon. He was just like fucking around. Don't worry about it." Um, and she's just like. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, what, what's more? Uh, and so, um, and so, but I thought in the second book, actually, it would be cool to build on that a little bit. And I loved the idea of having within the uh, within the afterlife, in the same way that we have, like you know, gods, gods and saints, or whatever, um, real versions of those creatures so you're like oh yeah that's 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 the devil yeah he's 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 horrible he's a real shit uh, you know or you know he's his you know his nema and she literally is like a, a sort of dear goddess and so i love the idea of having these entities as real but unknowable like unknowable so like just incomprehensible so you know there's sort of the nemans and the the the, the, the sovens of kind of oh yeah that's you know saint anthony and he is the painter said of this and he thinks in this way and actually it's just, just kind of eldritch horror that they just can't really comprehend and whose motives are kind of totally inscrutable um and so you've got the truth of the afterlife which is actually quite bleak and horrifying dimension mm. of you know unknowable 
you know, in entities. And then the kind of the, the church's taxonomy of the afterlife, which is, oh yeah, these are the angels and these are the demons. And if you're very good in life, you go to kind of the golden city and it's all good. Um, and so the answer is yes, it was always part of the plan to have a real afterlife with real things in it. But I don't think I expected to develop it in quite the way they ended up doing. Um, right. And it certainly wasn't going to be as much of a feature as it ended up becoming in books two and three. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting, I think. But I, having said that, though, I think it's one of the things that people really like about the books. Um, yeah. Is that is that is that kind of eldritch you know, horror aspect to it? Um, and I didn't quite set out to write a sort of medieval horror, but there are quite some frightening moments in the, in the trilogy as well, I think. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a bit of a blend of genres, but yeah, it's 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 ended up roughly where I roughly where I planned. Well, in the first book, there is that first time that Helena sees Sir mm. Conrad raise someone and speak to them, and her horror yeah. is absolutely palpable because yeah, she's yeah. never seen anything like it before. So it's communicated to the reader in that way. Yeah. Whereas if he because if he hadn't if he'd done it from his point of view, it'd be like exactly. it's still horrible and he doesn't like doing it. But he's kind of well, used to it, and he'd be like, "Yeah, exactly, yeah." Yeah, that's and that's one of the that's one of the great benefits of having done it in that way is you can explain because Helena, it's a it's a pretty classic device. Like Helena is an apprentice, and therefore, as von Volt explains things to Helena, you can explain it to the reader, and so it's a nice writerly contrivance, you know. Yeah, so it's yeah. a very satisfying kind of from a reader. So you're absolutely right. It's um, it's nothing new, but it, I think it works very well in that respect. You get to share in her terror of the of the seance I know, I know you can't say this and, and obviously you can't spoil anything but i'd kind of like to see a, another series or even just a, sh a story later mm. on where mm. it's someone it, not necessarily her apprentice but in 20 years time someone talking mm. about helena and maybe she's a justice maybe she's not maybe she doesn't survive who knows Although, given the, the <laughs> contrivance of the story mechanism, uh, she does. But she, she, she survives, yeah. <laughs> it's whether or not Sir Conrad survives the question. But anyway, well, you I'd know. kind of like to see the other perspective where suddenly, like, she's the kind of slightly more grizzled matron, oh, yeah, knows her powers, be... and then her apprentice is like, oh, it's, it's, quite, it's quite terrifying. And now we're seeing mm. her through a lens. Because that's the other that's thing. That's brilliant. I, you know what? There's, there's a book, I don't know if you've read Eisenhorn by Dan Abner, but. Um... Yeah. It's really, it's really good. So it's a black library. It's Warhammer, um, you know, tie-in fiction. Mm -hmm. But some of the, some of the best, you know, a some of the best Warhammer tie-in fiction, full stop. But also B, just excellent novels in and of themselves. Um, but they just, so I so I took so said Eisenhorn was a big impact on me. Like growing up, I read it in my kind of teens, and I've reread it a couple of times since. It's a trilogy of uh, there's four of them now, four books, and a bunch of short stories. And it's basically about an inquisitor, a sort of Warhammer inquisitor, and he's like, so he has a kind of similar powers to von Vault in terms of like his legal powers, essentially in the sense that it's un unlimited authority. Mm. Um, but it's from his his perspective. But there's a great um, so there's a tri there's an original trilogy, and it's very very good. But a few years ago, maybe a four or five years ago, Dan Abnett wrote a fourth book that was set decades after the third book. Mm -hmm. A little bit like what you've just explained, uh, mm -hmm. just described, where it's a non-Eisenhorn character being taken to kind of meet him. And, and, and so you get to see, and so it's, it's, again, it's decades after the fact you get to experience all of these things through kind of fresh eyes. So it's a really, so it's a really nice kind of narrative contrivance. So I, you know, I, I definitely would be open to something like that. But um, you know, what does worth wait to see? Well, because part of the, not the joy. So <laughs> I read um, the the Dresden Files by Jim Butcher. Mm. It's all first yeah. person from his perspective, but he's also done some short stories, and so we only ever see Helena in your books from her perspective, mm. how she sees the world, how she sees the Conrad, but we never see her yeah. how other people see her, and I suspect. By the mm. end of the third book, if someone then looked at her, they'd be like, mm. you've, gone all th you've gone through all these terrible things and look how mm. tough and enduring you are. Well, she's constantly like, I'm so afraid. I'm I'm scared. I'm fucking frightened. I yeah. don't know how to <laughs> yeah. do any of this. And they're going, hang on, yeah. you've been through all of these things and you're still standing. Yeah, yeah. You're amazing. And you're rock hard. And she's well, inside. <laughs> she's like, ah, a... the whole time. I, so. I know. It, I, I'm glad you said that because um, it's something I really... Um, wanted to capture with the internality of Helena was how basically and so over the course of the I'm I'm really pleased with the kind of the way her character develops over the the trilogy um yeah you know I think she gets into a sort of really nice place by the end of the third book in terms of her arc her arc I think it's you know I've done I'm I'm pleased with the way I've, I've managed to achieve it but um I did you know 
I think it can be lost in in these sorts of novels where the th you know just about if you think about Dan uh, not Dan but Dan Carlin who does a hardcore the, you know the hardcore history podcast I don't know if you ever listened to those but um he did a really good one uh, it was called Kings of Kings and it was basically about the Achaemenid Persian Empire and it was about um oh I can't remember uh, Darius not Darius or whoever it was Xerxes and you know, that whole shebang mm -hmm. yeah. but he was one of the, one of the episodes was on um the, the what he what he called the physics of the ancient battlefield um and it was basically like we no one knows for sure um how two armies actually met in the middle and even if they did you know there is a theory for example that the two armies actually approach one another to a distance of about 20 yards say and then actually just exchange missiles until one routed for example like so we don't so there's no kind of like we have lots of sort of but no one actually says this is the actual meeting of the so we don't know if they just ran into each other or, or what yes. they did um but he there's lots of kind of contemporary like herodotus he talked about herodotus and lots of contemporary records about like accounts of how the fight and you think about and it was saying like you know, if you think about the ancient battlefield, uh, if you think about the modern battlefield, he, he likened the modern battlefield to like, you imagine like a kind of jumbo jet crashing into the ground. You've got like, you know, bodies over a, a couple of kilometers and and it's it's kind of like, it's quite violent, but it's over very quickly and it's all that rage. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you think about the ancient battlefield, it's more like 10,000 individual murders. Um, and, you know, it's it's ve it's up it's necessarily very up close, and he's there's accounts of, for example, men marching in like a phalanx, and they've got like this is going to sound a bit gross, but like diarrhea running down their legs, or like you can hear that you can hear the teeth rattling mm. as as men approach, mm. or there's a there's an account of um, see, this is the medieval time now, but uh, the Wars of the Roses, um, in which I think it's the Battle of Tadcaster or something. Um, I think it's the very the last of the wars, the, the last battle in the Wars of the Roses, and um, you've got like they have from the skeletal remains which they unearthed. They've got guys who have like clenched their teeth so hard in fear they've buckled their molars. Mm. Um, like these people were terrified, right? Like utterly terrified, as you would be, right? It's very frightening. Yes. Um, and you know, you think about like a sort of an, enc an encounter like that. Only one of you is walking away from it, you know. Um, and so it's, I was trying to kind of capture, I think we lose sight in a lot of fantasy fiction and, 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 and historical fiction. I think we lose sight of the fear these people would have felt. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's all well and good, like marching into a battle. Oh, when the trumpets are blaring and you start, blah, blah. and we actually, these people were fucking frightened, right? And I really wanted to just get a sense of, you know, not that oh Helena finds herself at the front line of a battle, but Helena finds herself at the front line of the battle, and she really does not want to be there, and that's actually very frightening. <laughs> and um, and obviously all this like kind of eldritch, you know, horror stuff. Like when you go to bed tonight, Stephen, I want you to lie in the darkness and then just imagine there's an actual demon, like <laughs> you know, after after you. Thank um, you for that and, nightmare, which is I appreciate. Yeah, you're welcome. You're... <laughs> You're welcome. Oh, this welcome. is welcome to my you're welcome to my <laughs> break. Uh, and so, you know, and, and and so you just like we read about these things, but we read about it at a remove. Mm. And I was trying to just and so people, some people, some people almost certainly, I don't know because I don't read the negative reviews, um, but some people <laughs> almost certainly would have been <laughs> would have been like, Oh, well, I hate you know, Helena is so whiny, she's so miserable, like or she's so mopey, or she doesn't complain. And I was thinking, do you actually think about what she's dealing with? Yeah. Um, but you know, it's pretty terrifying and so i was kind of almost at pains to remind the reader quite frequently um about how frightened she would be because she would be very but by the end and by the and also but by the end in book three one of my favorite scenes is where she's talking to sir adamir and she's like basically she's like depressed she's got like full-blown depression because she's like mm. I'm frightened all the time. Like I can't. Everything I've she's been through and endured. She's got her own yeah. form of PTSD at this point. Yeah, and she's like, I don't know how I can't, I can't go on. Like how how can I constantly? And I can't even die. Like I can't even commit suicide because the afterlife is real. And, it's and I know how horrifying things. it is because she's been there several exactly. times. Exactly. So I was trying to kind of remind the reader of and 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 you know and sort of and so it was never Helena was never about like you know 
the sort of the Mary Sue kind of character, but really like a young woman who is just confronted with endless horrors, and and you know, even like the, you know, the like von Volt obviously suffers from you know some form of sort of veterans PTSD, and Bressinger is clearly grappling with the issues. Pair of and, them. Mm. Yeah, and rats around me. So they all have problems, and I think. Um, you know, it, it, I was trying to sort of get, but without kind of really weighing the manuscript down and just making it miserable, but at the same time, just trying to keep it. It's well, yeah, the, the, they're again. all trying to cope in their own ways. Like, like Sir mm. Adamir is is a functional drunk. Yes, he, he's yeah, constantly exactly. having a little nip to keep it the edge yes. off. But basically, that's, that's the only right. way to get through the day, and she doesn't understand how he can do it. He's like, it's the only way I can actually cope to kind yes. of function day to day. And now I've got the point exactly. where. I'm sure it's in the second book. He says he started with just like a small beer. And then by the end of it, he was having wine because that's yeah, exactly. what he needs to function. And she's yeah. she sort of gets it. She understands him mm. at some point, but he's she's still mm. a bit surprised at the way he approaches it. Yes, exactly it. that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's always great. I love pairing people when they've kind of absorbed the novel. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's, <laughs> and they can remember it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It's that thing of it, it creates not only creating realistic characters, but creating the mm. idea that for those who understand it so so in yeah. the coward um the main character has ptsd and i mm. the, the best compliment i ever had i don't they're mm. even like you i don't read reviews not even the five star ones uh oh, someone, really? no no I recommend contacted it. i should try that <laughs> dear steven it's five great. stars it's great. Ah, it's great. You. this was awful <laughs> you dick it's oh, awful dick. Yeah. <laughs> Classic. Um, uh, the <laughs> best compliment i ever had from someone about mm. the coward was they wrote to me and they said i was in the military you know, I suffer mm. from PTSD. Did you serve? Because it sounds like you have, given the way you've described stuff. Ah, uh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I wrote back, I wrote back to this person. captured the feeling of me. That was, that's the best compliment ever. Any review, yeah, yeah, anything published, you know, published a week, he gave me a star review. Love it. Fantastic. I'm very mm. appreciative mm. of that. But the fact that someone in the military wrote and said, you seem yeah. to have captured some of the element essence of this. It feels that's real. Right. Mm. Shows I've done my homework right. And I think yes. you have. Like, the fact mm. that Helena is in turmoil it's, it's even worse for mm. her because she knows the afterlife is waiting and it's not necessarily clouds and nice. harps and, no belly know. gates no yeah the heavenly choir uh, mm. but so in mm. connected to that my balance in quite my kind of follow-on question is mm. there are all these horrible things there's all these demonic entities and all the rest of it but yes not everyone lingers there it almost feels no. like the afterlife that we've seen is like a halfway house so there might yes, be some quite right. yeah. positive yeah. entities lurking there, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I don't want to let me think about it for a second. Do, do I want to answer this question? <laughs> no, I'm just speculating, Richard. Uh, they're perhaps yeah, well, quite, yeah, in yeah, the darkness. Perhaps. Surely there must be the light in some ways, you know. The, uh... There is, and I, you know, and I don't for for I um never set out to write like really bleak fiction. Um, yeah. I don't enjoy reading it. I don't, I don't take... think yours is grim dark. So if some people might say Definitely, that, I wouldn't is... agree. It's not grim. I don't grim think dark. it is. No, I don't think it is at all. Um, I think grim dark fiction is kind of exuberantly preoccupied with how dismal it can it can make itself yeah. um and that's never been i think it's pro i think you could properly characterize empire of the wolf as like dark fantasy or mm. like you know gr quite gr grounded low fantasy yeah um or certainly in book one um but it's not grimdark because um i think grimdark is kind of a total absence of hope isn't it like uh, everything is just shit um and you know you've still got characters who are fighting for something and there is a chance they can succeed at least. Um, but I um, was acutely conscious. I don't like reading reading stuff that's like just utterly bleak. Mm -hmm. um, I always prefer a happy ending as a reader. I much prefer that kind of much more affirming kind of reading experience. Um, and so I, w I would never like a, a book that just kind of nihilistically said, oh, well, then they all died and that was it. Um, I wouldn't, and I wouldn't write that <laughs> book either. Um, and so for, for every kind of demonic horror, um, you know, in the afterlife, I did think it was important to provide some balance. That is a, that is more of a book three kind of um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thing. Um, and what I also wanted to do actually sort of saw in that vein, because I think I, what I did was, I think it's very easy to kind of portray the, the church and the forces of the church as kind of like it's always fun to pillory the church, isn't it? Because yes. it's just so evil. <laughs> 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 I mean, but yeah. um, you know, it's 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 pretty low hanging fruit, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So I, I did want to um you know, and so Severina von Ostelen, who is the as you know, she's a Templar, she's a Templar yes. of one of the orders, martial orders of the of the kind of the of the Neiman Church. 
Um, and I did want to kind of use her, especially in book three, I think, to examine like, how do you, you know, how do you maintain your faith when you know the afterlife is a real place and, and the gods are potentially capricious? Um, and, you know, what does it mean to you to hear these things? And what do you think about the canon? And so, and, and, so, and, so, and so she is very devout mm -hmm. but and so her and her faith is important to her um so i wanted to have a character who uh, was a good guy you know that the readers can identify with and, and enjoy but who also was very religious um and and, and not to have her religious as necessarily a negative thing yeah. or portrayed in a negative way um and so I, again it was about and so i was just conscious of like well i've got claver and he's obviously like you know evil and can't almost like in a sort of pantomime way he's just a horrendously evil <laughs> bloke <laughs> so, you know and all of his templars are evil so oh great yeah the church is bad big whoop um and so i thought i'd like a little bit of balance as well so hmm. It's all about, you know, creating balance, balance. Yeah. Yeah. Darkness yeah, yeah. and balance. light. Quite. Mm, yeah. 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 Mm. Mm. So, so what can you tease about book three, which comes out in uh, February, February time? February. Yeah. I think it's the sixth. Um, what can I tease? What can I tease? I can say lots more uh, spooky, demonic, eldritch stuff. Mm, maybe, okay. maybe some more heavenly aspect. Mm. Mm. Uh, a okay. big old bat, a big old battle. Um, you know, I don't think it's a good, it's a book three without a big old battle. So, um, you know, huge battle, multiple chapter kind of battle on both sides of the mortal plane. Um, interesting. Okay. And my favorite, um, aspect of the book, a bloody great courtroom drama. Um, <laughs> you finally I, got it. I finally <laughs> did it. I was like, you know what? You know what? I see, I, I thought to myself, you you could throw a stone and hit a book, um, a fantasy novel with a with a fan, with a battle in it. You know, every big one. pretty much, yeah. They all have them, right? Yeah. What you can't do, it, I, and I was like, you know what? This is all about law. You know, this is like a this is a book about fantasy lawyers and judges and whatever. Mm -hmm. Just lean into it. Lean into the theme. You know, there are if someone wants to read something else, there's a thousand of the books that will cater to your basic bog standard medieval fantasy. Do the thing that makes this book kind of these series, these books a bit more unique. Yep. And so I thought I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna have a big old courtroom, a proper kind of salt of the earth cross examination. Dude, dude, you order the code red. You got that right. Order the code red. You know. <laughs> you can't handle the truth. <laughs> exactly that. Um, so I got that in. So that's my favorite bit of the book. Um, uh, yeah, lots of fighting and some good old philosophical discourse as well. Um, I'm really pleased with book three. I, I think it ended in a night, and, and everything is t totally tied up. You know, there's no cliffhanger ending or whatever. Yes, um, yeah. it's it's all wrapped up in a bow. Um, so yeah, but there's room perhaps for other stories within within this <laughs> world. <laughs> there definitely <laughs> is. Did, so, you, did it leave you once you finished that trilogy? Were you like, yes, I'm glad I'm done? Ooh, or did you go after after you took a break? Did you think? I wouldn't mind doing a little bit about that or exploring that a bit more, perhaps yeah, with a short story or a novella or a something. Definitely that definitely. Um so I when I I when I finished writing the third book, I was like, I'm so done with this. Always, like, yeah. Every totally trilogy, I'm like, like, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> finished never never again totally uninterested in it and then it wasn't until i went back through the final i got two lots of proofs because um we made some like typographical change mm. that had like a knock-on effect to the whole manuscript so i said oh, you know what can you just send it to me again um and uh, uh and it wasn't and when i read through it i was like oh, i kind of miss this world already like, <laughs> 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 mm. <laughs> so, yeah so um i i definitely gave myself some room if i if i wanted to revisit it let's do let's right, say yeah. that Threat, there's um, threads you could pull on yeah definitely um and i think it would be great to you know as i said do like a little kind of law and order sova um you know i think that would be like a nice little sort of sideline of self-published you know novels and novellas or whatever mm. um and i think it's a book because of the nature of the world and the characters in the sense of it's a legal drama you know you can do a story that's just a case um so yeah. it really lends itself to these shorter spin-offs as well uh, in fact i did one for grimdark magazine um i wrote a, a prequel short story um uh -huh. and it was just 
it was before Helena was in the picture, so it was just Sir Conrad and, and Dubai and Bressinger, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, doing a little kind of self-contained uh, mystery. So yeah, it, that sort of thing like, definitely could happen. I also had this idea of like, um, there's a bit in um, the third book. We meet the Wolfmen, right? The Khazar Ki- and the yes. Khazar Kiara. That was um, freaky, so they... by the way. When I thought it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it goes, oh, it's a statue that it moves. I'm yeah, shit myself. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? Oh, fuck. <laughs> just like <laughs> it's something like Ghostbusters, <laughs> but it just moves. And you're like, bloody hell, yeah, it's alive. Yeah. <laughs> it's like some statue of Anubis, but actually, yes. it's real. Um, I we go to the land of the Wolfman, and there's yep. a bit where basically, like, um, Von Volt's like, I need your help. And they're like, okay, here, have some, here's some troops, and then they and then they split off. And so, and you don't actually see that fight. And so I thought it would be quite cool. You could almost write like a little 15, 20,000 word novel of that fight. And then like at cons, I could just sort of give it out as a little kind of like Easter egg, you know, like, oh, mm-hmm. you did the missing kind of chapter, mm-hmm. um, which would be quite fun to do. I might okay. do that still, maybe okay. at Worldcon. 10th we'll anniversary, you you uh, put a little extra story in, say, so, oh, with, with extra that's content it, yeah. now. You the know? omnibus <laughs> edition. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, do Stephen King it. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. Mm. I, mm. something i wouldn't want to do i don't know if you would mm. is go back and rewrite books that you've previously done after years yeah. after the fact like steam king did because i think they're a time capsule of what you 100%. were like at that period and your yeah skill talent we even mm. call it level mm. Mm. you know like having now I gone did... through the traditional process for three books Mm. Is there anything in book one where now you're like, I, I could have done, but mm, uh, one mm. thing that, that I, I, you know what, it's interesting. I, I think I, it's interesting how we develop as writers, even like even now, you know, even yeah. as as experienced writers. Um, and I look back at Justice of Kings, for example. I really, I really like Tyranny of Faith. I think Tyranny of Faith is maybe my favorite book of the, the trilogy. I like all three of them, but I think that's my favorite. Mm. I love writing middle books. Um, and because uh, you've still got the, you've still got the promise of the third, so the story isn't finished. No, nope. but you've expanded, but you've expanded the scope of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so I love writing the middle book. It's often my favorite. Interesting. Um, a lot of people don't. They think it's I know. middle book it's slump, usually... and I'm like, I yeah, don't. I don't think that's a thing. But anyway, it's not. Um, but uh, with the first one, there is a few, there is one thing I definitely would change. And ah. I was talking to you about this before we went on, which was uh, some of the epigraphs in the chapters. That people have like, and it's it's always the ones that I think are quite shit. Um, <laughs> I just like, oh, fuck it. I just, I just I just need something to put here. Like I'm so tired of coming with epigraphs. <laughs> blam 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 blam. You know, write any old rubbish, and then like someone's like quoted it. It's like, oh, this is my favorite quote from the Justice of Kings. I'm like, no, no, I hate that one. Like, that's the worst <laughs> one of the lot. You know, so I definitely would have maybe put some of the, you know, because some of them the problem with epigraphs is like some of them i'm really i really like and like i'll read them and i think oh that's just giving me a bit of like a bit of chills like i've done a good job with that one and then some of them are almost like rolling my eyes at my own epigraphs like oh that's a bit kind of that's a great bad. greeting cards hallmark moment yeah Life exactly is like it's very an empty road oh deep yes. and someone else goes that <laughs> it's shit the... what does that mean it's that... <laughs> i think the problem but we can we i think we're all a bit guilty of this <laughs> as fantasy writers is like you're you're trying you're trying to sound profound on you like and uh, mm, yeah. and you can try a bit harder and you can kind of you can overwrite certain things um and i think we're all guilty of that from time to time but it's you know, n- never more so than an epigraph which are tr- which are obviously like written with the with the intention of making a point anyway yes um and you can just kind of like, over you can overdo it a bit can't you and i think um some of them in the Justice of Kings, I'm like, I, I almost wince when I read them. I'm like, oh, God. Like, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> so if you read oh, the Justice of Kings the first time, skip the epigraphs. Just yeah, change the story. Just, Some of them are good. Just move on. If you want to read them after the book. That's right, yeah. The, sort of, Some of them I'm happy with. There's haikus. Yeah. Read one every day once you finish the book. That's there's right. Haikus. Yeah, yeah. Sort of saving thought for the day or something, isn't it? <laughs> Little book uh, of calm. Just read the. Read that's them. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so book three is uh, coming out in February, and as mm. we just you just mentioned, you are coming mm. to Worldcon in the UK in yes. Glasgow in August 2024. You will be there in person, but barring unforeseen circumstances. Yes, yes of course. Indeed. Of course. Excellent. Shall. Well, there you mm. go. If you want to meet Richard and uh, ask him what all the epigraphs mean in detail and underline no. them and go through them, please do what, <laughs> form Lordly Q. He'll be happy to explain uh, uh, they yes, mean very right. little. 
Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hated that one. <laughs> this is your favourite one. Oh, good. Yeah. I love it's that shit. One. <laughs> <laughs> Let me explain to you why it's not good writing. Oh mm. God! But I guess yeah, you're working this... on something new already. I am. Well, well you know, I mean, I've. I finished. I finished it. You know, it's not even been announced, and I finished it. Um, Announcement coming. Hoping to next have some year? news. Do we think my maybe next year? Because my third book, my Transfer Empire, is out next year. So it'll be the year after. It'll be twenty twenty five. Okay. Um. Yeah. Yeah. But it's but some, there is something coming. after book three's come out. I would think they'll they'll make the announcement. I would think. I yeah, honestly, I don't know when they'll do it. To, to be completely honest with you, um, mm. but there's something in the pipeline. Let's Excellent. let's say that much. Mm. Um, Yes. Okay. Mm. Very, very exciting. Very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can leave you to your wine because I think you need some. Uh... <laughs> My Ribena, more like. Mm-hmm. And I'm just, I'm just cool. starting the day. Excellent. Very good. Well, yeah. thanks for coming back and talking about how much uh, we my just like Rings of Power. Um, yep. I enjoyed it very much. <laughs> <laughs> Go thanks, on, Stephen. Thanks go for having me. Check out Richard's books and uh, see him next year in person if you're in the UK or you're coming to Worldcon in Glasgow in August. So I will be there as well and I'll see Richard Excellent. and uh, oh, you, like, question, him, question him about the book very yeah, carefully. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, absolutely. All right. <laughs> Good thanks, night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>